You ready for some Hungry Hungry Dragons? Well, this may not be an episode of Game of Thrones. I'll bring the fire-breathing dragons if you bring your scientific wonder. And make sure you don't have any sweets on you because that's what these dragons like to eat. All right, let's science. Potassium chlorate, or KClO3, is a highly reactive compound in the form of a white crystalline powder that contains you guessed it, potassium chlorine and oxygen atoms. It is the most common chlorate used for industrial purposes, used as a disinfectant in safety matches, in fireworks such as smoke grenades, primers for fire and percussion caps, and in those popular tiny noise-making fireworks you may know as snappers, crackers, or poppets. Oh, that was a oh, oh, oh. <laughs> It's even used in the cultivation of some trees to produce fruit. All very random, I know. Most importantly, however, potassium chloride is a strong oxidizer or oxidizing agent. When we talk about oxidizers, what we're referring to is a chemical species that creates a significant amount of oxygen as a byproduct in a reaction. This can be very helpful in all sorts of applications. And in potassium chlorate's case, those powers of chemistry have been put to such great uses as chemical oxygen generators meaning potassium chloride is used as an oxidizer in oxygen supplying systems on aircraft, in space stations, and even in submarines. Ever wondered how they don't run out of oxygen with all those people inside a submarine? <laughs> Mind blown. If we want to get deeper, when we talk about oxidizing agents, what we're really saying is that these agents remove electrons from other atoms. This makes them unstable and reactive to, well, almost anything they're brought into contact with. How highly reactive? Well, on the standard system for identification of the hazards of materials for emergency response scale of instability and reactivity, it's rated a three on a four scale. That's higher than chemicals that react violently with water. So, pretty reactive. What then do you think will happen when we heat five grams of it to its melting point, around 700 degrees Fahrenheit, and then drop in a piece of chocolate covered Candy? Wait, what? Okay, random, I know. So let's take a step back, literally. Let's talk about candy for a second. As you can see, the color on the candy shell burns off almost immediately. That's because food dye has an extremely low boiling point. I mean, come on, it's only there for looks, right? Does anyone care what it looks like once it's in your mouth? But why does it happen so easily? It has to, I mean, it was designed that way chemically. You know that phrase, melts in your mouth, not in your hand? That specific slogan was a selling point for these little candies for years. It's their signature move, so to speak. This candy shell is literally created to withstand human body temperature of just under 98.6 degrees for when they are subjected to the tiny little human oven you call your hand as you are holding them before you eat them. However, they are also designed to melt in your mouth, the temperature there being you guessed it, 98.6 degrees. So factoring in for the fact that the environment you're in and your core body temperature at the moment of holding the chocolate candy dictates the exact temperature of your hands, we'll say the temperature of your hands varies from between 89.6 to 93.2 degrees Fahrenheit. There are a number of factors that can play into the melting point of the chocolate. Amount of cocoa, how much of it is milk, so on and so on. But none of that really matters because it would take way too many variables for a chocolate company to make a product that wouldn't melt at one temperature, but would completely melt at four degrees higher for anyone around the world, regardless of climate. It just doesn't make any sense. So how can they claim that? <sighs> because we're not talking about the melting point of chocolate at all. What we're really talking about is the melting point of the exterior sugar-coated candy shell. Sorry for taking the long run home, but that is really what is allowing them to make that claim. The chocolate? is just a ringer. But that doesn't answer our question. How can it be just fine and not melting at one temperature, and then a few seconds later, melted? Because when we talk about it melting, we're not dealing with its temperature, we're dealing with its dissolving properties. It's not the chocolate that melts in your mouth. Well, it is. But it only after the candy shell dissolves in your saliva. Or for all you impatient candy eaters, once the candy shell is destroyed by your chewing. The candy shell all along wasn't just there to look pretty. It was more like a pretty, insulating, encasing body armor for the chocolate. Okay, now we can move on. The second one of these little guys hits the liquid, two things happen. It starts to physically melt because the candy shell is designed to do so in any liquid. But this isn't just any liquid, it's potassium chlorate, an oxidizing, reactive, somewhat unstable compound. Like we said before, potassium chlorate is known to be a strong oxidizer, which means it gives up oxygen. And a lot of it. In this case, when we melt it. So that's exactly what we're going to do to five grams of our compound in an ignition tube. We're going to heat it up to about 700 or so degrees until it becomes 
molten. And what happens next? may surprise you. Just kidding, this isn't clickbait. You're already watching. But because potassium chloride is a strong oxidizer and therefore pulls electrons away from atoms is exactly what makes this a combustion reaction. You see, atoms and molecules don't really take kindly to having electrons taken from them. You could say in a hypothetical way they kind of take it personally. But scientifically what's happening is this molten compound really, really wants electrons. And it will take them from whatever it physically can. As soon as it is put in contact with it, whatever it is. So when we feed it organic fuel, i.e. an unknowing piece of chocolate candy, you can only imagine what's going to happen. It's going to combust because it's a combustion reaction. We already covered that. So let's recap. We freed up all the oxygen, then we added candy, which is a sugar, an organic compound, and dropped it into a high temperature potassium chlorate environment, and the oxygen begins to react with the sugar coating on the candy shell to release energy. Got all that? That's what we're seeing. In short, you're seeing a combustion reaction with the source of oxygen being the oxygen given out of the potassium chlorate. In effect, turning it into potassium chlorite, which is fueling the reaction of the organic compound, sugar, with the potassium chlorate. And that's why chemists can use all sorts of things for this experiment instead of non-branded, unmarked, candy-coated chocolate, like gummy bears, and jelly beans, and even wooden splints. Wait, what? Wooden splints aren't candy. I can't eat that, it isn't even sweet. No. Please don't. You'll wind up with splinters in your mouth. It's very unpleasant. It happened to my cousin one time, and never mind. So if you go back to our requirements for the reaction, all that's stipulated is organic material. That's all the oxidizer needs to initiate the reaction, which can mean only one thing, that this whole experiment has been an organic chemistry experiment. You understand an organic chemistry experiment. Don't you feel so smart now? And because this reaction is a combustion reaction, it is highly exothermic, meaning heat is the byproduct of the reaction, along with burned sugar and a completely fine and working combustion tube that is now trash. Unless you want to clean that out, which I do not. It's going in the trash. Now, about that purpley, lavendery flame that came out. What was that? The food dye from the candy? The heat from the experiment? Well, no. When burned, potassium gives off a beautiful lavender color. Sodium burns orange. Magnesium burns white. A lot of elements have their signature color they give off when burned. You may have even seen those pine cones you can buy that change the color of your backyard or campfires. They're coated in various forms of these elements. It's not magic. It's chemistry. There's even a test we'll get to later on on this channel called the potassium flame test. So check back for that later. Like if you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you want to see more scientific videos, and here's one more crack it or popper or whatever you call it.